I think what's important to understand is that all this stuff is connected. You know what I mean? It's not just about plant based, like the the government control, like you were talking about, the healthcare system, the global companies, um, the push towards you know the climate. All these agenda, all these individual things are all connected, and I think that so they it's like you can almost get sucked in from any one point whether it's the the vegan thing or you know the saving the planet thing or you know we want to turn over and redo this system in the government thing and then it's like you kind of get it you get stuck in all of them you know what i mean like you get you go around the circle and then you think okay all these things must be true because they're all you know connected together and so i think again once you've looked at this stuff and thought, okay, well, you know what, I'm going to go this way and do the meat thing because that's what actually works. You start to question all these other motives of these other things that are connected. Hello, everyone. I am so happy to have you back with us today. Today we have, I'm going to just call you by your YouTube name, Nia's Way. I don't even know your last name. We're going to find that out maybe eventually, or maybe you like to keep it that way. <laughs> but <laughs> Nia is a stay-at-home mom and carnivore diet advocate who believes health is the foundation for everything else that we do in our life. And that by working to heal root causes, both in the body and spirit, we can move forward towards fulfilling our unique callings in life. And I totally didn't just copy that directly from your YouTube bio. Uh, <laughs> so why don't we hear just a bit of background from you, Nia. Tell me about who you are, how you came into this space of carnivorism as a yogi and a mom, and just the origin of your YouTube channel and how you got to here. Yeah, thanks for having me on to chat today. I'm excited. Um, yeah, my story is kind of a long one, um, and it goes back. My health journey really started as a teen um, when I started having digestive problems. Um, and so I have kind of just spent the last, and I'm 37 now, and so I've kind of just spent, you know, the last 15 years or so really just um, trying to figure out how to improve my health, kind of recover or, or heal from um, digestive and autoimmune problems. And I've also been really interested in personal development and spirituality throughout that time as well. And that's been a big part of my healing story and, you know, evolution forward. And so I try to combine all those things um, in the content that I create, um, because I think all of it's so important. And obviously, nutrition is one of those things that's so important to get right, right? Because if we're, if we're not healthy, if we're not giving our body the nutrition it needs, then I don't really feel like we can get to any of those, those next levels of being more creative, being more, um, you know, living more for serving others and fulfilling our dreams and goals if we're not feeling good and we're not healthy. And so it's always something I've been really passionate about. And um, I've tried so many different things. And so I feel like I have um, just a lot of um, personal knowledge, you know, just experiential knowledge. And I enjoy sharing that because I think that's, that path is the way to go when it comes to health and nutrition a lot of times, because most of us, if not all of us have, um, struggled that have struggled some way in some form or fashion with our health have been through the, the standard of care, the modern medical system. And many of us have not found relief or really root cause healing in that way. And so I think the N equals one journey is so important because it, it teaches you so much about yourself and it teaches you how to be intuitive, how to connect with what really works and what really matters um, and, and prioritize your own health. Um, and I think that's something that we need to do uh, on an individual basis, honey. Uh, sorry. So, um, yeah, so my healing journey, you know, my health journey really started, like I mentioned, in my in my teens, um, digestive problems being the main thing that really caught my attention. And at the time, you know, I was pretty embarrassed about this stuff. It was very uncomfortable for me to talk about. And so I really didn't tell anyone about it. Um, and it was kind of this, this secret that I kept. And, uh, but when I started getting, I left home and um, 
you know, got a job and kind of went out on my own. And I, so in my early twenties, I started really thinking about, okay, what is my diet? consisting of because there clearly there's something revolving around my diet my, the food that I'm taking in that is contributing to this this discomfort right because it's always after I eat or it's always following eating you know certain things and so I, I kind of always had it in my head that I could figure this out the natural way through diet modification and figuring out what diet I was supposed to eat and so that kind of got me started into reading and and listening to podcasts and, you know, watching different things and trying to figure this out. And initially I went down more of the plant-based route for a couple of reasons. Um, I was um, getting these colonic treatments done, um, probably, you know, in my early twenties and where you go in and it's um, basically they put water into your colon and flush it out. Um, and I was getting those done once a week because I could not use the bathroom, like, um, you know, IBS C to IBS D fluctuations, things like that. And so, um, I ended up going in to get these treatments. Um, and this, the practitioner, practitioner there, she said, well, have you heard of the blood type diet? And she tested my blood type and told me what it was and said, okay, well, you can, you know, find the diet that might help you through this. And I'm a positive. And so, uh, you know, by that, that, um, grouping, it, it told me that I needed to eat a lot of whole grains and a lot of vegetables, a lot of fiber, you know, and then of course for constipation and things like that, they always tell you to just increase your fiber, increase your water and move more. Right. And that's supposed to magically fix everything. Um, you know, and I think it said vegetarian was best, but I think it, it included like lean protein, like chicken breast or turkey breast or something like that, that, you know, you could use sparingly or whatever. And so I tried that thinking, well, that makes sense. Right. Um, my blood type, that should, you know, have something to do with my genetic history, perhaps what my ancestors ate, maybe that's, maybe that's valid. Um, but, you know, that quickly, I quickly realized that it was not because I, my, all my symptoms got much worse. Um, and, you know, around this time is when I started to notice there were <laughs> um also some mental health concerns coming in. And I didn't even really know this until looking back in hindsight, but just the amount of, the amount of brain fog that was occurring, I think was just, um, it, it almost induced this kind of apathetic depression that I would fluctuate in and out of. So it was just like no motivation to do anything, very low energy, chronic fatigue, um, just couldn't get you know, excited about anything in life. And that would come and go kind of, de you know, depending on how bad my symptoms were flaring and things like that. And so, um, so I initially kind of went down that vegetarian plant-based thing, but the blood type diet wasn't working. And so I thought, well, maybe vegan, you know, maybe I just need to get harder, you know, cleaner into this plant-based thing. And I started reading books by Andreas Moritz. Um, I read a couple of his books and, you know, he talked about how bad meat was and how bad fat was and, you know, they cause cancer and all these kinds of things. And so really going vegan was the thing to do. And so I, I tried that where I did just mainly fruit, but also like raw fruit and vegetables. Um, but I only lasted a few months on that because I um, had a couple episodes at work where I thought I thought I was going to black out because I was just losing getting so dizzy and like even just like turning around to look at something it's like whoosh like the room would follow you know what I mean like and just extreme bloating extreme pain extreme bowel symptoms you know that just never went away um and so you know and there was a bunch of other things I I did tried during different cleanses and um things like that during that plant you know more plant-based time which we can talk about if you want, but that was probably, you know, a three to four year period. And then, uh, there were, you know, a couple episodes where I was like curled over in pain and I went to the ER thinking, you know, I have a bowel obstruction or something. They did a CAT scan, but they said, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, we don't see anything that, that is concerning. And so just wasn't really getting anywhere. And so that's about the time I stumbled upon, um, the paleo diet and more of an ancestral approach. And I thought, wow, this makes sense. You know, this, this seems like it makes more common sense to me, right? This is what, this is more of a traditional diet for human beings. What we've, you know, uh, been eating for 
a long, long time. And so basically the, the main switch there was cutting out grains. So I had been eating some meat again and things like that, but I was not eating much fat. Um, and I was still eating a lot of like grains and vegetables and things like that. Um, so cutting out the grains was the first time I was like, oh, something, something has improved here. It was like, we, we went up a little bit here, but then I kind of plateaued soon after that. Um, and so, so really from there on, probably from my mid twenties, like 25, 26, all the way to about age 30, I just, well, I was slowly eliminating foods one by one, group by group, and learning more about like FODMAPs where, you know, all these fermentable saccharides basically of all the different kinds um, are just sitting there essentially rotting and fermenting in the small intestine where they're not supposed to be causing SIBO and things like that. And so I'm like, maybe that's, you know, that's where a lot of this is coming from. And so I had eliminated grains and then, you know, really all starches, potatoes and things like that came out. And then, you know, any starchy vegetables. And then I learned about the FODMAP. So I started cutting those out. So I was basically down to um, like large salads, leafy green salads with some olives and bell peppers and cucumbers and then meat. And I would make my own salad dressings at home from like olive oil and vinegar and, and you know, no, no bad seed oils because I had learned about that. And so... Um, at that, so that kind of lasted a while because I was sort of limping along on that and then I was doing home enemas because I couldn't afford the colonic treatments anymore and it's just kind of hassle a hassle to get there and all that kind of stuff so I was doing like a lot of coffee enemas just salt water enemas things like that I bought the home kit but I was in order to feel like I had a somewhat complete elimination I had to do those like every other day minimum and they would still cause fatigue and I think you know the electrolyte issues probably one of those reasons but just um you know and then you have loose stool for a whole day after that like it's just it's not sustainable and so but I was at that was kind of like the best band-aid fix that I had found you know in during this whole time um and then there were a couple of days that went by I was just really busy um where I had just grabbed some meat leftover cooked meat out of the fridge and eaten it. And it was like three days in a row or something like that. And it took me a few days to realize like, wait, I don't think I had any, like I didn't get bloated after I ate. I didn't have to run to the bathroom or I didn't feel like, you know, a, a crunching, like grind, you know, um, twisting pain in my, in my stomach. I didn't have any gas, you know, I was like, I didn't really have any brain fog. You know, I was like, wait a minute. And all I ate was the meat. And then I thought, maybe that's all I can tolerate. Maybe that's, maybe it's just meat. And I was kind of mad about it at first, you know, I'm like, this sucks, you know, cause I enjoyed salad and there's some veggies that I like and things like that. But I thought that's weird, you know? And then, um, I kind of went back to the internet and this was right around when Dr. Sean Baker first had his, um, podcast with Joe Rogan. So this was like early 2018, I think like spring, um, for me and the podcast so, was in December 2017 at the very end of 17. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was right around there. And then Michaela Peterson's story came up was the other one. And I just remember listening to her story and with, you know, her arth arthritic problems and depression and all that kind of stuff. And I was just like, I just, I think I cried. Like I was like, this is, this is me, you know, obviously not the same exact thing, but just like decades of suffering from this, this immune autoimmune type thing and just not know, you know, all the, the regular advice and the, I don't know, I've been to some doctors and who gave me, you know, advice that I didn't help that we can talk about too. But, um, you know, her story just really hit me and I was like, okay, there's something to this. And then I'd also found a blog called zero carb Zen at that same time was, which is a story of a woman who kind of went through very similar things, lots of weird elimination diets and stuff. And she had just gone to meat only. And I thought, okay, this is a carnivore diet. And this is, this is working for people. Like people are at least getting remission from their symptoms by doing this. Um, and so that's how I found carnivore, just through a process of elimination over years and years of just really trying to figure out like what foods are triggering me and why and how much and when. And, um, and then I went off the diet when I got pregnant, which we can talk about. And then now I'm back on for what I call my round two. Um, and I'm in month nine right now. And I've played around with the lion diet and um, I'm doing some different fasting protocols now to kind of like finish up 
finish up the rest of the symptoms that I'm still dealing with. So that's kind of like the medium length version of my story. <laughs> I love it. And I'm, I'm so happy that there are people like you sharing like the full details of that, because a lot of those things you're experiencing are not uncommon, but they're not talked about because people don't want to talk about them. Like I, right. I told you before we started recording, I've just been bouncing all over the world recently. I was in Mexico a few months ago and I actually met a girl there who I, you know, just had having a late night talk with her. She was vegan. So of course I'm trying to kind of, you know, work people toward the right direction, not be too aggressive, kind of help her through. And you pretty much just need to talk to someone who eats plant heavy for a long enough time. And you'll figure out that they've got some issues that they're hiding. And for hers, it was digestive. It was constipation. She, and, you know, of course, she doesn't go around talking about that. But I, I heard it just by talking to her for a while. And these people just have been so misled on what is good for them. And the fact that, like you were saying, the recommendation when you have a clogged up digestive system is to put more fiber in there, which is indigestible, is absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. It's it's such a mind blowing rabbit hole to go through for so many people because it doesn't take a whole lot of research to logically figure out that we've been duped, but there's so much of an emotional layering there of just the amount of times we've been told this our whole life that we we have such a strong connection to that. And I'm not sure what your experience is with this, but you talked about how Michaela Peterson was a big uh, entrance for you and you really resonated with that strongly i think there's a lot of reasons why probably not only just having all this pain when you're younger but just being constantly misunderstood and not really heard by your friends your family or doctors and on top of that being a woman so you're automatically going to get just gaslit even more just saying like you're crazy like you're going through hormones or whatever, and they're just not going to really give you the time of day and help you solve the actual problem. Would you say that that's an accurate assessment of your experience as a woman going through this experience? I mean, I would, I would say definitely in terms of the doctors that I saw, you know, and, and like I said, I didn't really tell anybody else close to me about it. Cause I just, uh, you know, was really embarrassed. And then there was, you know, the time where I was like, I'm, I'm scared of the symptoms that I'm, I'm so afraid of the symptoms that I'm having that I am going to go in, you know? And I remember that, well, the first time was the ER. Um, and that, you know, kind of didn't really amount to anything. And, um, but then I did after that, I went and, and saw, you know, a general practitioner and, and I kind of laid out this whole thing that I just told you. And cause at that time I was taking fiber pills because they were, you know, producing, they were producing a bowel movement, but it was like, you know, once a week, maybe, or once every two weeks. And it was still pain, you know, still having all the symptoms associated with it. And I knew that wasn't the root cause, but at the time it was like, it was sort of working, you know, again, as like a, a, a bandaid that was just, you know, I could sort of rely on. And so her response to that was, well, you know, if the pills are producing the result you want, then just continue to take them. And I thought, you know, that's not why I came to you. Like I already, I already got th that far, you know what I mean? Where it's like, this is at least kind of helping, but it's not, it's not fixing the root cause. It's not, you know, you didn't explain to me why I'm having this in the beginning, what could be causing this. And she didn't even offer to refer me out to anyone, you know? And so I never really went to see a gastroenterologist or anybody, you know, any specialist like that. Um, it was just kind of like, well, we don't know, or we don't know what's wrong with you. We don't know what to suggest, or we don't, um, you know, just, just kind of keep doing what you're doing. And I guess you just need more fiber. And it's like, you know, clearly that's not working. And then, you know, I also had psoriasis um, intermittently throughout this entire time, gutate psoriasis. So I get like the little leopard spot ones. Um, and that was, that was right around this time too, where I, uh, had like this huge flare, uh, where I was like, my whole body was covered in these psoriasis spots. Um, and so I 
went in for that to the dermatologist, you know, and, and that was kind of the same thing. They're like, well, here's a steroid cream. And there are several students that were in with the, with the doctor there that day. And they all looked at, you know, looked and stuff. And then, um, after the students left, she came over and said, you know, like, here's your steroid cream, but, um, you know, we're not really supposed to advise this to people, but if you, if you get out in the sun and don't wear sunblock, you know, that could help your skin. And I lived in Florida at the time. And so I was like, well, perfect. Cause I, I already do that. Um, but I don't, I don't know if I was really wearing sunblock at the time anyway, but, um, so I, you know, I did both of the things. I put the, the steroid cream on and I went out in the sun and they eventually went away. But, um, then I've had, you know, intermittent things. So again, it's like, here's, I, and I, that just struck me. It's like, why did she have to be so covert about that information? It's like, because, in that field, right? Derm uh, dermatology, it's like, you know, the sun's going to give you cancer and you need to cover yourself in sunblock all the time. And so, um, in order to prevent that, it's like, well, we're preventing the vitamin D absorption, which is essential for so many functions, you know? And so that could be a part of my root cause. Right. And so, you know, throughout all those experiences, although they weren't helpful necessarily. There were like little bits and pieces that I picked up from everything. It's like, well, why did she have to say it that way? Well, why did this woman just tell me to keep taking the pills? It's like, cause she doesn't know. She doesn't know the answer and she doesn't even know who to, who to ask, you know, or who to send me to. So like this system's broken, you know what I mean? And that it just kind of actually fueled my own desire to figure this out on my own because I thought, like you were saying, there's prob I'm probably not alone. There's probably lots of people that suffer with all this stuff, but they just don't want to talk about it. And so if I can figure this out, maybe, you know, I can pass that information on to someone else. And so that's why I'm passionate about sharing now because it's just like, hey, hey, here's what I've done so far. Here's everything I've been through to figure this out. Maybe I can save you a few steps, you know, of, of time and effort and things like that. Yeah, and just the, I had Nina Teicholz on recently, and we just talked nice. about how the incentives are so misaligned across the entire medical industry and the food industry and the government. They're all now this trifecta of just nastiness that is causing bad outcomes for all of us. And the big food companies have worked their way into big pharma and vice versa, so now all of the the textbooks that the doctors are given through their entire education is basically telling them that nutrition doesn't matter they have like two hours of nutrition classes through their entire medical school it's completely glossed over and every doctor will tell you that and they're just basically just pounded in the message that there's like root cause healing is this you know it's like the pseudoscience it doesn't matter every single problem you find is a pharmaceutical deficiency so you need to find the right exactly. pill to plug in the hole and then you're good to go Sh kick them out the door and get your next patient in there and and so many people are having that experience where they like you said they, they're in their doctor's office being told like oh the solution to your problem is to take this drug and we just start to think that can't be right this seems odd and we're seeing a divergence now of doctors starting to break free from that mold. Like uh, I know that you were on Dr. Ken Berry's podcast recently and my guy is Dr. Chafee, Anthony Chafee. He's my man. And I started his podcast and that was really what gave me hope, not just for human health, just being able to fix all these things, but also for doctors that there's like a new elite class of doctors who are breaking free from that and saying, we're done with this. We're going to figure out the real problems and help people empower people at a grassroots level by getting this out on YouTube and podcasts. And that right. in combination with people like yourself who have a story to tell, it's just bringing so much power into people's hands. And that's why all these people who have fixed these problems by just removing the plants from their diet are feeling so not just energized nutritionally because they're all of a sudden their brain isn't clogged up by grains anymore like you said there so they have all this physical increased energy and now all this motivation to help others because i i really do believe that humans innately we want to help each other and when we learn something that we believe will help a lot of people we just feel invigorated to go put it out into the world and i know that that's what you're doing 
your channel just crossed 20,000 subscribers. So I'm sure it's amazing to just look through your comments and just see people just loving to follow your story. And uh, that's just super cool. And I'm really happy that you're doing that. I'm sure you've changed a lot of lives and it's a very exciting time to be here in the space for sure. Yeah, I agree. It really is. And I, I totally agree with, um, with what you said about you know, just more and more people coming to the platforms to to talk about it. And I'm really grateful there's a lot of doctors now in the space who we can get, you know, information from from this perspective and get a lot of the the more nuanced medical side of the things, you know, those questions answered. Because I think that that is a deterrent for people if they are very much um I don't want to say indoctrinated. That's a strong word, but in, in some form or fashion, it is, you know, it's just like conditioned to what is sort of the norm, you know, my plate, the food pyramid, you know, low fat, all, you know, caloric restriction, all these things that are supposed to work. Right. Um, and, um, so it's hard to make that shift over to something as radical as this seems in contrast without getting some of that baseline information from somebody who does have the credentials, who can read the studies and interpret them and, and see which ones are, are done right and which ones have flaws and why that might be and can talk about that. And so I've been so grateful to have all, you know, all the professional, the medical professionals who are speaking out too. And then um, absolutely, like from my, from my position as a lay person, you know, like I, I can play or fulfill the role more of like, Hey, here's the lifestyle component, right? Here's how I shop. Here's how I make this affordable. Here's how I break down bulk cuts of meat to save money. You know, here's how I feed my family. Here's how I navigate social situations, you know, and, and talk about some of those things, which are also, uh, you know, a, a very big part of switching over to eating this way because it really touches every area of your life. Um, and so I think, no matter where somebody's coming from, there's a, there's a place for you to share. And, and you can be, you know, that information can be highly valuable to people when they're, they're curious or they're trying to adopt this way of eating. Yeah. And you nailed it with your wording there. You said that this diet seems really radical in contrast. Right. That's the key <laughs> word. It's, it's compared to what we have all grown up believing that we need to be eating mostly plants when throughout all of human history plants were at the absolute most like an emergency backup food or a few berries here and there to not starve and as long as we've existed we've been trying to get our hands on as much fatty meat as possible because we knew that that was our best fuel source it makes us feel the best and it makes us live the longest so the fact that people have just completely forgotten about that through decades of I'm going to say it, indoctrination. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's really crazy to watch. And like there's the shift that's happening is very interesting because there's a lot of powers that be that don't really like that shift happening. The, the companies that make a lot of money from the really addicting, you know, seed oil, carb crackers. And, you know, they're making tons of money when people are addicted to garbage food. Big Pharma is selling more pills. And the government aspect, which is another interesting one, I, I talked to Matthew Leshek. I'm not sure if you've heard of his book, Fiat Food, mm. but he comes from the Bitcoin mm. world. So he's sort of a, a new voice in the carnivore world. But he talks about how, and I'll try to summarize it as best I can. The government also benefits from people really being sick and unwell because it's just easier for them to inflict their power in certain ways and just do push through really ridiculous policies when people are not thinking very clearly and powerfully Absolutely. able to revolt. And mm -hmm. also from like an inflation standpoint, it's easier to hide the inflation numbers from how much money they're printing. And I know we're getting a little bit deep here off track, but I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it no, up. That's good. <laughs> when that's good. It's easier for the government to hide the inflation numbers when they have this food like product that can be uh, basically factory made. And it's really easy to like just squeeze the margins and just pump out more of this stuff. And it's not the same for meat because meat will always take work. You have to, you have to take the life of a full cow. You have to farm it well, you have to raise it. So it, it takes work to do this. It takes less and less work 
to make chemical food like products. And so they love that because then they can come out on TV and say, oh, inflation is so low. We're doing a great job. All this money we're spending is totally well spent because people aren't uh, there. People think that things aren't getting more expensive. It's more easily hidden. But, you know, those of us that are buying ribeyes can see that this price just continues going up and up and up. And that's because Mm -hmm. that's the actual pricing mechanism in action. The other things can just be hidden better. Like it's it's easier to keep making cheaper and cheaper boxes of cereal over time through technology. But crazy rabbit hole over there. I definitely recommend that episode. I'll put it in the show notes for people because it's a crazy one. But I'd love to take things back a little bit because you talked about when you started with your story how eliminating the plants and adopting the carnivore diet helped your issues that you were having. But we didn't go into real detail of that process for when you started doing that. How did you watch your issues resolve? What were what were the first ones you saw getting better and how did that happen? Yeah, so um, again, since this was over such a long period of time, it, it took some reflection when I when I first kind of put my whole story out there about six or seven months ago like I had the like three pages of notes you know because there were so many things um that happened kind of slowly over time and so I I the main thing I remember the biggest shift was that shift from plant-based to to paleo when I really cut grains out um that's when I first noticed like the brain fog was a lot less and I didn't get nearly as bloated or you know experience like the extreme gut pain that I was kind of used to. Um, And so for a while I felt good, you know, but then it would sort of just plateau and then I'd start getting these episodes again of, you know, pretty severe constipation, diarrhea, there would be, you know, all kinds of other things that were just kind of terrifying um, that would come out sometimes. And I thought, you know, am I dying? Like what's, what's happening? Um, And so you know, that's what kind of prompted me to continue to eliminate things. And so I'd say like then cutting out, cause then I was eating more like sweet potatoes, potatoes, just the starchy vegetables that, you know, you can kind of have on a, on a paleo diet. So that was the next thing to go. Um, and so I would, I would really say like the main categories were digestion problems that would be immediate at, upon eating or would even like, it would take even a few days sometimes to have, um, a flare up from something. And I think as sort of a side note of something I've learned over this whole period too, I may have like a, like a slower transit time just on average. I don't know if that's a result of, of being ill, you know, in, in the intestinal system for so long, or if that was maybe one of like the root causing, maybe that's just the way I was born or something. But, um, so I think because of that, you know, things take so long to just get through the process that I would have, you know, sometimes two, three days later, if I would eat something, it would take me that long to figure out, oh, that triggered a symptom, you know? And so it was kind of a process of figuring that out timing wise. Yeah. Yeah. And so that really made it difficult because I would, you know, I'd eat a food and then, um, sometimes have to wait that long to know like, well, was it that specific food or was it something I ate yesterday or two days ago, you know, that, that kind of caused this episode to occur. And so, um, but, but that would get less and less frequent as, as I went, you know, as over time. Um, and so cutting out the starches, things got significantly better. So digestive symptoms were one category, like the brain fog mental component was another category. Um, and then my skin has always reflected inflammation in the form of like rosacea, um, eczema, and then psoriasis. So I've kind of always had like really sensitive skin that will flush really easily. Um, I'll get like um, eczema on the backs of my arms and my legs. um, And then the gutate psoriasis will kind of just pop up randomly, usually in the winter. And then, you know, they'll stick around for five, six, seven months, sometimes longer. And then they just have gone away on their own in the past um, after that one big flare I got. So those are kind of the main three categories that I paid attention to. And so really just as I continued to cut things out, I noticed like just slow improvements in all three of those things. So I would get psoriasis, but it would be like one spot versus five over a winter, you know, and then it would, you know, kind of just go away on its own. Or I would have shorter periods where I just felt 
super demotivated, you know, and just like, I don't really want to get out of bed. I have, I don't want to go to work. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to do anything. Um, but then I'd have these alternating periods of anxiety and we can talk about alcohol too, because alcohol was a big, um, part of this and it was part of my coping strategy and, you know, the ways that I would fast longer. And I did, you know, I worked in restaurants for all this time. And so there was a lot of partying going on too, which is not healthy. Um, but I, but I drank a lot of alcohol to cope with physical and, and mental and emotional pain. You know, I had a lot of social anxiety and I was in a very social job, you know, and so that was very like taxing. And then just kind of having this secret life, right, of, of all this pain and things that I was dealing with. Like I never wanted to eat before work because I would be afraid that, you know, I wouldn't be able to go to the bathroom and, you know, you kind of just are stuck there for 8, 10, 12 hours kind of with no real set break times or anything. So it's just very, you know, it's just stress, like it's just constantly stressful because this kind of runs your life, you know. And so, um, but but over time, you know, the more things I cut out, slowly the better all these things got or the less frequent or the less intense they would be. And so by the time I got to carnivore and I cut out that last bit of greens, it was like, bloop, like I flipped, finally flipped that switch. It was like the last, they say like the last 5%, you know, you get some of the, the best results because, you know, eliminating all that fiber. And that was what was really causing all this initial problem you know I don't know if again fiber by itself is the root the root cause it may be the sugars it may be the oxalate it may be you know all these other toxins that are in plants but cutting out that last bit of fiber I was like okay I'm doing uh, now I know I'm doing something right because this is this is a significant change and then the longer I did it you know nothing came back I had no psoriasis the first time I had uh extremely clear had my anxiety, like I still had some anxiety, but I think that was again related to, to alcohol use as well. Um, but I had motivation. I had like actual happy, good feelings more on a consistent basis. Um, and you just don't feel bogged down and heavy and just bloated and sickly and weak and, you know, just constantly tired. Um, so like that really, it took going a hundred percent meat only you know, to, to get there. And I think, so that's when I knew like, okay, this, you know, there's gotta be something about this. That's true. And this is why it's so hard to not just lose your mind trying to talk to these people who are, you know, have these issues because it can be so quick to clear up. Our, our bodies are so good at fixing these issues. If we just remove the poison and stick to healthy food, it's digestible. And has all the nutrients you need, <laughs> but right? sometimes it's just so hard to get through to people that they don't want to believe it's that easy. Because then, you know, it, they'll have to come to terms with the fact that they've wasted so many years trying to, you know, do all these stupid solutions. And let alone doctors. Like if you try to tell a doctor, like, "Hey, I, I fixed this thing that I've been coming to you for for years, and it took like a week," you know, <laughs> they're not going to love hearing that because they. They spent years of their life going to medical school, school to be taught that you need fiber pills <laughs> for digestion, mm -hmm. which is yeah. absolutely crazy. And so and steroid cream you, for psoriasis, just topical drugs, sunscreen for your skin outside. Like don't go in the sun. And, and I love your story of the woman like needing to be private about that because that's very telling is the, these people know that there's a better way but they're, they've invested so much time, money, and energy into getting their fancy piece of paper that says they're a doctor that they're, they're scared to piss off their bosses and lose their license. So it really takes those special few that just don't care and are really the extreme healers out there, like the Chafees and the Bakers and the Berries, who, you know, like, I mean, I don't even know if they, they care about that anymore because like they understand that there's a much bigger battle here to help people heal and get out of that system of needing these things. And that's why it's, these people are so fiery because it's that important. And a lot of those issues are private, like the digestive system can use, or the digestive issues you talked about can be private, but a lot aren't like 
the, the skin problems, the acne, the eczema, the psoriasis and the bloating. Oh my gosh. Like mm-hmm. talk about bloating. When I was in Mexico, I, I would do a lot of walking around public and my God, everyone is bloated in Mexico. Like you just walk all over on the beach in the mall and everyone just has like a pregnant belly pretty much. And when I'm thinking about it, like, huh, what is the Mexican diet? It's a lot of tortillas. It's a lot of seed oils. It's a lot of rice, a lot of beans. Mm -hmm. It's just a ton of these plants that are exactly what causes that. And, you know, it's not even that much better than the standard American diet, to be honest. We basically just switch hamburger buns for tortillas. And other than that, it's pretty much the same, (laughs) like a little bit of meat, but a whole lot of plants that's just preventing you from healing. So it's it's a really wild wild battle we have ahead but that's that's the way it is I, i'm i'm feeling optimistic to be honest I, I see the tides turning i do too you know and it's it's funny you say that because um i have a a thursday live stream show on my channel called carnivore mastermind and we so it's like a panel of carnivores and we you know, pick a topic for, for each week to kind of discuss. And that's kind of the topic for this coming Thursday for tomorrow is like, you know, is this just another diet fad or do you really see hope for this? Like actually making a dent in the problems that we have, like looking even globally, kind of like you were saying, like we have such a, like the Westernized standard American diet is, has permeated, you know, many other countries and cultures where so much of the diet is processed in food and beverage and, you know, alcohol use is rampant and all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's so, it's just, yeah, it's everywhere. And so what do we, what do we do? You know, and these, these companies, like you were mentioning, they're becoming, they're global companies, right? And they're, um, their interests are in keeping us addicted to these foods. And so it is, it looks like an uphill battle. Um, but we have, we have the internet, we have these platforms that as long as we are somewhat careful with what we say, right. To not get ourselves completely, um, kicked off, we can, we can get this information out. And I think results speak for themselves. And I think the more people, have results and speak for themselves, um, we can, we can make a difference. And, um, when I was, um, interviewing Dr. Barry on my channel, he mentioned the statistic, which I did not know about was that, you know, I would have thought it would, it would take like 51% of, of a group of people to, you know, kind of turn the tide and, and switch the direction that something's going. Um, and now, now I can't remember this, the number for sure, but I think he said it was something like 20%. You know, it's this like actually relatively small number of people that, you know, can take an idea and, and move that idea forward and that can actually make significant change. And so, um, that's really inspiring too, right? Cause it's not like we got to get the entire planet on board with our point of view. It's like just enough of us need to change, you know, and if, if 20% of us get healthy and, and get off all our medications and don't have mental health and diabetes and, you know, chronic diseases anymore, then that that's enough, you know, to actually make a big difference and potentially fight back against some of these, you know, mega entities that we're talking about. So I'm hopeful too. I'm optimistic. And you never know who's listening either, because there Mm -hmm. are big names with big audiences out there which will tip the scales in a hurry like Michaela Peterson, Jordan Peterson, they, they go on Joe Rogan with Sean Baker and like those three episodes of Joe Rogan alone basically just provided the spark for this entire thing to start it, like almost everyone's journey traces back to one of those three and the more big names that start doing this and figuring it out it's going to get more and more exciting because there's also a, a simultaneous trend on social media, people just being really real. Because for a long time, Instagram has been sort of a place where people just post the highlights of their life and everyone's sort of in a popularity contest. And there's, of course, still some of that. But I would say there's definitely also a trend of people, uh, you know, millennials like us who are just saying, like, you know what, I, I want to be I just want to let it all out here and just be completely real and tell my real story and, you know, start a social media channel and try to share more about my life, the real side of my life. And people are finding that this makes 
it feels a lot better too. It doesn't it doesn't feel good even if you're the person posting like the, only the best stuff because then there's like all this pressure you have to uphold, mm -hmm. and it just takes so much stress. But as people are becoming more real on social media, they're also learning these interesting strategies to heal themselves. And as those things are happening at the same time, I think that we're definitely at a catalyst point where, like you said, I, I don't believe it has to be 51% at all. It just needs to be a really loud minority who can just push right. through and get people to just, just try this. Because I think that a lot of the public's like threshold of desperation is starting to get there where I don't eat, like I'm terrible at numbers too. I don't even ask me any statistics, but so many people have, you know, diabetes or skin problems or mental health problems. I, I mean, we can all think of just so many people in our life. I'd say more than half of the people that I've been friends with in my life have had some sort of mental health issue that they've battled with. And it's, it's so common for that to be fixed with this just changing a diet, which is really simple. And as people mm -hmm. get to that point where they're just in desperation mode, I'll try anything, they'll figure out that's all it took the whole time. And then the more people figure that out, the ball continues to roll. And I loved seeing more and more types of people make this realization from different walks of life and different, uh, just different, have different audiences. And this is a good segue into another thing I'd love to talk to you about is the more spiritual side, because you are a yoga teacher. And I think all of us know that the yoga world is very much a plant-based world and just the spiritual world as a whole sort of believes that the best thing to do is eat lots of plants to not eat meat because that's evil. You're eating an animal and you should feel bad and you should eat this salad. Um, what is your take on that? The state of the spiritual world right now, like how they were tricked into eating plants, how it's going for them. You probably have some good inside info there and how you feel about that yourself. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm I'm not officially a yoga teacher. I'm not complete, you know, I'm not a registered yoga teacher, but I've been practicing for a long, long time, uh, you know, over 10 years. I would years. say you post your yoga on your YouTube. So you've taught I me do. for one more than I knew before. Okay. So I'm going to call you a <laughs> yoga teacher. Okay. Um, I, I am certified as a group fitness instructor and I have a specialty in functional movement. So that's almost like the Western version of yoga. It's basically, you know, foundational movement and, and integrated full body strength and mobility so that you can perform your everyday activities with, with, you know, strength and grace and fluidity so that you're not injuring yourself and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and I, and I'm, that's something I, I am very passionate about. I'm going to be putting out more classes shortly now that I've got a little, um, studio space here to do it in. Um, but yeah, that's something that I, I don't know if I would say it influenced my dietary choices early on, but, um, I definitely picked up on that, you know, that, uh, especially while I was more plant-based that like, yeah, this is, this is the trend, right. It is a little bit more spiritual and, um, you know, all of the, the yoga people seem to be in that, in that camp. And, um, you know, I, I did do some reading on the, like what, what were the roots of this? And, um, I think in, in multiple different religious contexts, it ultimately goes back to this idea of like the garden of Eden, like before there was the sin or before, you know, when everything was perfect and all was good, we just ate from the trees. Right. And we didn't have to, you know, kill anything in order to eat. Um, and so, uh, but then there's also been, um, influence from like, I know in, in the United States specific religious organizations that have, um, had influence over like the American Dietetics Association and, and things like that. I believe that one was actually founded by um, Seventh-day Adventists uh, that, you know, their church. Um, and so their belief is that, you know, being vegetarian or being vegan is, is the, the more spiritual thing to do, right? Because eating meat causes more desire and it causes more lust and it causes more of these things that, you know, we should essentially repress or, you know, not really, exercise because they're against what God says. Right. And again, I'm not trying to, maybe I'm over summarizing it, but that's just sort of the general, the general consensus that I, 
that I've found. Um, and so, um, that, you know, and there, and it's not that it's a healthier diet. It's not that it's better for humans. It's better for your potential as, you know, being, you know, attaining enlightenment or the path to God or, or whatever it is. And so that's where I think the conflict is in my opinion, because it's like, well, I have no problem if someone believes that way, you know, if that's what you believe and that's what you want to do with your own body, your own diet, you know, for your own religious practice, like go for it. I'm, I don't, you know, that doesn't bother me, but let's not take your religious belief and make that government public policy for, you know, essentially the globe now, right? Like, you know, all Western society, like let's take that and make it, you know, 60 to 65% carbs, lots of whole grains, uh, don't eat any red meat, don't eat cholesterol, don't eat, you know, these things that are ultimately providing us with the vitality and the, the nutrition that we need to build strong, healthy bodies, including our minds, which is, you know, the mental health component here. And so, um, you know, and this goes back a long time, even into Buddhism and, and Hinduism and things like that with, with the vegetarian thing. And so again, it's like, that's fine if people want to, want to do that, but it's, it's become now not just about a personal choice, um, based on whatever belief system you have. It's like, this is, this is what the whole global agenda is, is pushing towards a, a plant-based thing. And, and kind of like when you were talking about the Bitcoin guy earlier, like, I think what's important to understand is that all this stuff is connected. You know what I mean? It's not just about plant-based, like, the the government control like you were talking about the healthcare system the global companies um the push towards you know the climate all these agenda all these individual things are all connected and i think that you, so they it's like you can almost get sucked in from any one point whether it's the the vegan thing or you know the saving the planet thing or you know we want to turn over and redo this system and the government thing. And then it's like, you kind of get it, you get stuck in all of them. You know what I mean? Like you get, you go around the circle and then you think, okay, all these things must be true because they're all, you know, connected together. And so I think, again, once you've looked at this stuff and thought, okay, well, you know what, I'm going to go this way and do the meat thing because that's what actually works. You start to question all these other motives of these other things that are connected, right? Like, so I, I think I kind of went off on two tangents there, but as far as this, what I see in the spiritual world, I think, um, you know, it's just like anything else. It's just as easy to get sucked into a, a dogmatic way of thinking about things, um, just because everybody else is doing it or because it looks like the cool thing to do or because everybody in your yoga class is doing it and that's what the teacher does. And so that must be the right thing. Right. And so I'm very, um, I'm very aware of, of dogma, or at least I try to be, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm skeptical by nature and it's always been pretty easy for me to enjoy poking holes in things and questioning things and really challenging my own beliefs. And so that's what I try to continue to do. And that's actually helped me evolve my own spiritual practice is because I, I don't really adhere to a specific religion. I don't really adhere to a specific, um, you know, way of practicing my spirituality. I just have a relationship with, with the entity that I feel is the higher power that I've always felt in my life. And I try to speak about that in a way that like use language that is broad enough and, and non-specific enough to include, like to make these concepts um, meta. So I try to take the concepts that I feel are, are fundamental in, in what I've learned throughout my own spiritual journey. And I try to speak about those in a way that um, is sort of universal. Right. And that's why I love a lot of Jordan Peterson's work, um, which I've talked about recently on my channel, too. It's like this, these stories are how we have um, like the, the biblical stories, for example, like he's doing his book tour on right now or, you know, just stories in general, mythology. Like these are ways that we pass down information and wisdom and knowledge and, you know, what works 
before we had writing, before we had books, before we had, you know, technology and computers and the internet and everything. It was just oral tradition, right? And and song and dance and music and art and and that was all the, the cultural way of passing on this kind of intangible information that people wanted to share with the next generation. And so I think that that is always powerful and that will always be around. And and so, kind of like I was saying, I don't really subscribe to any particular brand of religion. I just think that you can see you can see God or, or whatever you whatever you call that in everyday life. I think you can see, um, I think you can feel that you're being led in a certain direction, and that's that's all about tuning in. And I think, again, going back to nutrition and how that applies when you have good nutrition and you, you shed your addictions, you know, I'm not addicted to alcohol anymore. I'm not addicted to, um, like media in a way that, so I can zone out and forget about my problems. I'm not addicted to being angry at everybody for everything anymore and holding grudges against people. You know, I'm not addicted to, um, you know, almost like a sense of pride where I have to be like, Hey, I'm good. You know, try to prove that I'm good enough. It's like, I, I have never felt more comfortable just with being who I am ever in my life. I don't have anxiety about that anymore. And I don't have fear. I mean, sometimes, but like I used to have an insane amount of fear about saying what I believe, you know, saying my opinion and receiving criticism or, you know, if someone disagreed with me and it's like, now I don't have that uh, nearly to the degree that I used to. And I think that's because of my nutrition, right? My body is balancing itself out. My hormones are re-regulating. I'm not suffering from these addictions anymore. And so I can actually tap into that intuition, which is how I can feel God saying, this is what, this is the path you need to go. This is what you need to say to people today. This is what you need to make a video about. This is what you need to teach your child. This is where you should live. You know, this is what you should do next. And I, and I could feel that at different times in my life, but it was so muddled with all this other junk going on in my head that I didn't trust it. And I usually didn't act on it. And then I would end up regretting it later. And so now I feel like I live in this like magic world, you know, where it's like, I am actually interacting with God, you know, I'm interacting with that higher power on a daily basis now. And I feel that that relationship is so much stronger because I don't have all this crap clouding my vision and my intuition, which is, I believe is the way God speaks to us is through those gut feelings, right? And through our, our true desires, like the true desire, I believe that's from, you know, from the higher power. And so I hope that's a good answer, but um, that's kind of, that's how I feel we can all evolve in that way is to take care of our nutrition first, take care of your health, because I don't think you can hear it and I don't think you can trust it and actually follow that guidance if you're sick, all, you know, chronically sick all the time. I resonate so hard with all of that. I think that the, the spiritual world is one that I haven't explored very deeply yet. And I, I certainly want to. I, I'm pretty much at the level of like I've been to a handful of yoga classes, like read a couple of cool books, done a little bit of meditation, but definitely not really dove in. And I know from my little experience, though, that there's a lot of people in there that are missing that nutrition aspect. And I'm so excited for them to figure it out because there's a whole new level that comes unlocked once you have that figured out. Because like you said, that is the absolute baseline of your ability to be a healthy, thriving organism on this planet and in this universe. And people who do a vegan diet because they think it saves animals, which it does, and it kills a lot more, but mm -hmm. they, they believe that they're doing something good and this is like an altruistic thing. So they don't even care if it, it sometimes, if, if they know that they're being unhealthy and they're hurting themselves, they think like I need to do this because this is what is better for the planet or for the animals. And that's just such a sad way to live because wouldn't, you know, wouldn't the, whoever the creator is or the spiritual being of the universe want you to be your happiest, healthiest self. Like I love the animals too. We all love the animals, but you, you are an animal. So you should care about yourself before anything else. 
and then you'll have more energy to create great things for the world and you know be a good human being and produce and solve problems and you know and like i said going back to the fact that just a misconception in general that you're you're saving any animals by eating a vegan diet it kills far more organisms and it extinguishes so much life when you have to do monocrop agriculture which is required for growing mm -hmm. all these plants um so I really try to push that. Have you, have you done any research on that yourself? I'm sure that's pretty relevant to the work you do. Yeah, one of my one of my favorite voices to listen to is uh, Dr. Peter Ballersted on this topic because he's a you know uh, PhD in forest agronomy and uh, has like a, a minor in ruminant nutrition or, some, or ruminant agriculture, um, and he's like a super nerd, you know, like breaks down all. So I've listened to a lot of a lot of his presentations um, and his interviews on Dr. Chafee's podcast and Dr. Barry's podcast. And um, and I know there's others out there, but I think what I love about his work is that like kind of like you were saying before, people coming to the finding this way of eating from all different backgrounds and different walks of life. That's what's really going to, I think, cinch that, you know, throw this in the bag for us is like he, you know, is not even in the nutrition, the human nutrition space at all. He knows a lot about animal nutrition and um, the soil, you know, and that's one of the things that really struck me about listening to his presentations. Um, well, and then so like, and then he found this way of eating. And so now he's kind of in the nutrition space too, talking about like, hey, guys, like we've destroyed the soil from this monocropping stuff. You know what I mean? So like, even if we, and the, there isn't even enough arable land on planet earth to support, uh, you know, vegetarian, vegan diets for the planet either, you know, cause that's one argument I think they'll make sometimes is like, well, you know, if we just took the land, we grazed animals on and turned that into farmland, we could feed everybody, you know? And it's like, but not all that land is arable. You can't grow corn or soybeans or rice or wheat on all that land. Like sometimes it's only just grass that can grow there, you know? And so, um, but the soil health is is something that just really struck me because that is something that is that takes a lot of time and effort and meticulous care to regenerate you know and and that's been that's been destroyed through you know taking animals off of, out of that system out of that cycle like everything works together and so you can't remove the animals from the system and expect to have the same system, right? It's it's not going to work that way. And and we're finding that out because our our even our produce today doesn't have the same nutrition as it did 50 years ago, you know? And the more we continue to genetically modify and and breed these organisms to be drought resistant and pest resistant and all this stuff, it's like is that like when does that still qualify as food? Like what nutrition is actually in that anymore? Um, and then not to mention what it has to be sprayed with, even in organic in an organic setting, like to call a food organic, you can still have organic pesticides used, right? And you, you just don't know at the end of the day what you're actually getting out of that food unless you sent that specific piece of broccoli, which is not a real plant in nature, by the way, it never actually existed until we invented it. Um, you'd have to send that to a lab and they'd have to, you know, put it in their thingy and burn it up to tell what was exactly in it. And then you'd never get to eat it, you know? So you, I don't even, I don't even know from a plant-based perspective, how you can even ensure that you're getting any kind of nutrition at all. And even on the animal side of things, like it's still hard to know for sure, like how many minerals and how many vitamins and how much you're getting out of, that animal because you don't know for sure what it actually ate and what it had access to. And so we, we've done a number um, on, on the soil and on the arable land that we do have globally. And so re regenerative farming is the answer to that. It's going back local. It's going back smaller. It's, um, you know, incorporating the animals back in a healthy way. Because like you said, I don't want to see CAFO animals suffer. Like I don't, I'm not for that, but like Dr. Barry says all the time, that's kind of the box we've worked ourselves into right now. And if we were just to eliminate all of that, then millions of people would starve to death. And so is that what you guys want to do? You know, is that what we should do? I don't think so either. So what we've got to do is through our choices as best that we can, you know, vote with our dollars 
and uh, work towards supporting our local ranchers. And like, I don't do that right now. And I'm very honest with my community. I'm like, I shop sales. I buy at the regular grocery store and I don't buy grass fed meat, but that's my goal. My goal is to eventually get a big, you know, another freezer or a set of freezers or something like that and work up to, you know, purchasing a whole animal from a local rancher here in Texas and support them because they're the ones that are doing this work to bring the soils back, to raise animals ethically, to create healthy dairy products and produce that maybe, you know, I do want to feed some of that to my child. And so that's the other thing. It's like, you can make your own choice for yourself, but then when you think about your kid's health, you know, and what you're feeding them, it's like, that's, that's something that gets, that gets me riled up about the, you know, whole plant-based thing too. Cause I'm like, man, you know, it's, it's depriving these kids of, of vital nutrition that they really need to, to grow up healthy and smart and strong. And so, um, yeah, there, there's all kinds of things that I think people can benefit from, from learning this information. And again, I'm so grateful to all these experts like Dr. Ballerstead. And I know there's another person, um, I'm forgetting who's kind of more in that that farming Frank Midloner is another one, uh, Joel Salatin, um, the White Oaks Pasture guys, Will Harris. Yeah. There's so many great ones. There are a lot. Yeah. Also, Jane Buxton, Lee Air Keith. I, I'm not sure if you followed their work, but mm -hmm. excellent, excellent. Yeah, so I just think there, there's so, kind of like what you were saying before, there, there's so many ways to get into this um, and find out that, you know, this really – this really is the answer for so many of our problems today. It's the answer for help, you know, helping to regenerate the soil. It's the answer for this kind of insane globalist kind of food system that we have that we kind of saw exposed in the last four years, you know, where it's like with the transportation issue and, you know, how if, if something major happens, like a pandemic or something, you know, and, and things get disrupted, that affects a lot of people in, in a negative way, right? Because we're so we're so far removed from where our food actually comes from and how it gets there, and all the work that has to go into that, and all the people's jobs that that you know are incorporated into that. And so, you know, that's something I really got a window into, you know, or paid a lot of attention to over the last few years. And so, I think getting healthy as individuals is step one. You know, taking control of your health no matter what your budget is, you know, and that's why I try to, I try to talk a lot about the meat I buy and that I, I just buy regular cheap grocery store meat, you know, because at least just get started. You know what I mean? At least shift to more meat if you can't go full meat and you want to. Um, but there's ways to do it affordably and then work up towards the next step, which I think is getting back to a local, supporting the local people who are doing that hard work of, creating, you know, healthy farms and healthy ranches and things like that and healthy animals and supporting local communities. And I think that's how we're going to, again, with that grassroots mindset, really start to, to get the ball rolling because that's what we need. We need strong communities again. We need strong families. We need strong, healthy people who can see the world for, you know, see what's really happening and make good decisions. And I think that's what's going to keep us moving in in some sort of a positive you know hopeful direction as as a country as a world in the next few decades you know yeah absolutely and i love how you made the point that you don't have to go to the absolute highest end of the best meat possible right out of the gate and one of the things that ken berry says i love you probably heard this you the, you don't need the panda massage meat <laughs> immediately like right. even even the most bottom shelf, ultra pro like processed, hormone filled meat at the gas station is still going to have more nutrients in it than a plant. Uh, yes. And like speaking of the hormone bit, that's something I went into when I had Dr. Chafee on here. Plants have way more hormones in them than any sort of meat does, no matter how much they, they try to add hormones to the cows. Um, like soy is like, if you look at the compare the two, soy is like maximum hormone level. So, yeah, if you don't want the added synthetic hormones, don't eat plants. Don't eat um, plants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, where was I going with this? I, I would love to hear more about the mom side of things. Pull on the mom thread because I personally 
grew up in Seattle where, I mean, there's very few cities on earth that are more vegan than the Northwest. And I've had friends who are just, you know, I'm 29. So most of the people in my sort of friend group I've grown up with are starting to have kids here and there. And I know vegan people who, first of all, struggled to even have kids because they were so infertile because of their diet. And now they're pushing on their kids as well. And you talked about that, how you believe that that is not the way to go. And I'm definitely with you. I think that that's a huge problem. What would be your message to the moms out there who are looking to feed their kids the best food and give them the best chance at life with out having all of these other confusing factors potentially like really rug pulling those kids opportunities in life yeah it's it's such a tough question because you know when when you become a parent you realize how hard it is you know how hard it is to make decisions that affect someone else's life you know and i i lived a long time without having any kids and so you know and and i've always had this experimental mindset with myself and I, you know, cause I'm the one reaping the consequences. And so it wasn't that big of a deal to me. I thought, Oh, if I try something, it doesn't work. I can just change it. No big deal. Cause I can feel what's going on. But when you have a young child and you, you don't know exactly what the outcome is going to be of the things you do. And so it's terrifying, you know, to think about making choices for someone else that you love and care about so much. So, you know, The first thing I would say is that I think, you know, deep down, every parent wants to truly do the best thing that they can for their child. And, and most people, you know, I'm, there's always exceptions, but it's like most parents are just doing the best with the information that they have at the time. And so I, I just want to give credit to that because I think, I don't think any parent who loves their child is going to say, well, I'm going to feed you this diet because I think it's subpar, you know, or I think it's going to stunt your growth or limit your potential. Um, I think that parents who feed their kids vegan or vegetarian think that it's a good way to feed their kids, you know, and, and what, what really bothers me is that you can go to the pediatrician in many cases and they'll say, well, as long as you do it well, you do it right, you know, you balance it properly you know, I've read articles that say that, that, that that can be appropriate for growing children. And I just think that's appalling. That's absolutely just boils my blood. You know, I, I don't understand what research that's based on. It isn't based on any. And I don't understand how that makes any common sense based on our ancestral, you know, our history. Um, and so the next thing I would say, I mean, is that Go listen to the interview I have with Dr. Barry on my channel because that's what I asked him specifically about childhood nutrition. That's all we talked about for the hour. And that's kind of how I prefaced that conversation. I was like, look, you know, I came to carnivore just purely by experimentation. I didn't do it because I thought it was the healthiest diet. It just was working for me. So how do I know as a mother that if I feed my child this way, it's, it's also good for her. Am I just like an outlier? Cause I was a sick person and maybe she should have a different diet. You know, is there like a different diet for everybody type of thing? And, you know, essentially it's, it's when he puts it in his proper human diet terms, it's sort of like, well, duh, you know, a proper human diet is appropriate for all humans, no matter their age. Right. And so, um, if you believe the ancestral evidence that we have been predominantly, like you were saying, seeking out and intentionally chasing after, you know, the, the flesh and fat of ruminant animals for the vast majority of our 2 million year. I mean, anywhere from 350,000 years when we are, um, you know, about the, the same as we are today, as far as our structure and everything. And then our previous evolutionary history, um, back into around 2 million years, um, then that is, that is what should be the predominant fuel source for our children as well. If I was a mother 350,000 years ago, I would have given birth out in the bush somewhere, probably with all of the other women helping me and supporting me in my tribe. And then I would have breastfed that child, um, for years, you know, and then when that child showed signs of wanting to take what I had or putting things in their mouth, then I would have given that child whatever I was eating, whatever we were eating, which would have been, 
you know, predominantly animal based. And like you said, sometimes tubers or berries or things if they were in season and, you know, that was needed as, as an emergency food source or a, you know, something to put on fat, right. To put on a bunch of fat before winter. And so, you know, that's what we should be feeding our kids in my opinion, um, is a meat, a meat heavy diet, including red meat and including saturated animal fats. And so, um, I just think, you know, again, the more we can transform our own health and, and continue to spread this message in love, you know, because I don't think degrading people or shaming people for their, their lifestyle or their diet choices is helpful. I know I don't want people to do that to me. And so, um, you know, just being an example as best we can will will inspire other people to maybe just try this. Because like you said, a lot of times people have these closet health issues that they're not talking about, especially if they're on social media. And, you know, they've been doing this for 10 years. And it's like, I've been vegan for 10 years. And I've been telling everybody, you know, I can't change now kind of a thing. And so it takes a lot of courage to try something new. And so, um, you know, but I guess what I'm getting at is that you know, say you have a vegan parent and they want to raise their child vegan, like if, if we can get to somehow get to that parent in a way that that resonates with them, that convinces them, hey, maybe I want to add eggs or maybe I want to add fish, or maybe I want to try something, then obviously that's going to trickle down into the child's life. And so I just think, you know, and then on the flip side, you know, you hear people who have been vegan since they were children, you know, or kind of raised that way and, and they're finding carnivore now and like they're starting to heal. So we, our bodies are resilient and we can heal from a lot, but obviously my opinion is it would be better to start, start them off with that, that fundamental nutrition for brain health and growth and, you know, all of that. So, but it's kind of hard, you know? Absolutely. And, and this is one of the patterns that I see so prevalent among the carnivore world is just starting to think really long term, generationally, because we know that the tentacles are so deeply dug into the system as it is right now. It's not going to be an overnight change. And I'm, I know that you and I are both optimistic that things are going to move quicker Uh than many, many probably do believe. I'm, I'm definitely optimistic. The more people we have get on social media, the quicker we can move this needle. But there's going to always be a huge portion of the population that just is never going to be able to get it. And we're just going to need time to go by. And the healthiest people of the population, like nature is really brutal and survival of the fittest is a thing. So the people who are eating the proper human diet and having healthy, strong children, having big families are simply going to take over. And we're going to see this as more and more people figure this thing out. And uh, lo and behold, when you're eating lots of meat, you start having kids. <laughs> the hormones <laughs> get fixed and you just want to get busy. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, these, <laughs> these patterns are just naturally going to happen. And the more people we can help, be part of that solution and moving toward the correcting of the human diet and really just getting people to just start asking more questions about like, wh where did we get these ideas from? Because when we hear this constantly pushed on us from all of these different institutions around us that we've been talking about, it's so easy to just believe it because it's pushed on kids, you know, like, I mean, to walk through the grocery store, and every single cereal in sugar water is just marketed to children. And they're really trapping people basically from birth. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really, really, really deeply ingrained. And we have to be part of that, that turning of the tide. Because it's, it's going to literally be the decider of our species moving forward, which is kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah, So absolutely. Nia, I appreciate you so much for coming to join me today. We're getting pretty close to an hour and a half here, so I want to respect your time. Why don't we wrap up with your message to the universe and say I'm a vegan who's listening. You know, actually, let's do this. I think there are a ton of people out there that have such similar stories you have. I told you about the friend I made in Mexico who very similarly was you know, eating a plant-based diet, was 
having health struggles, was hiding it because, you know, their identity is vegan. They don't want to be the one to break from that vegan tribe. But they're starting to open their mind a bit to thinking maybe I should do what's best for me and fix my health and not worry about anyone else. What do you say to these people and how would you inspire them to make this change in their life or at least try? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think if I had to summarize all of it, I would say that, you know, you deserve to feel good. You deserve to feel like I'm feeling right now for the first time in years and years and years and years where I wake up. I don't need caffeine anymore to get going. I don't drink any caffeine anymore. Um, and I just feel like motivated. I'm excited about life. I have energy again. I can play with my child and do work here and, you know, be, be a mom and, um, support my fiance and like, and, and be happy about all of that and, and be genuinely happy just doing the day-to-day -day things that are going on in my life. And I think that is, that is what true happiness is. It's not about, I mean, I'm all about goal attainment and, and striving for things and, and pushing yourself and things like that. But I think sometimes those, those aspirations can, can even be cover-ups for the fact that we're not feeling good just in the moment. We're not comfortable with who we are and we don't feel well. And so, you know, no matter where you're at in your journey right now, whatever diet you're eating, whatever you're struggling with or suffering from, know that you deserve to feel good. You deserve to just wake up and feel well and feel like you just have joy just for being alive and appreciate another day to just do the day-to-day the -day things that you have in front of you and also to pursue the goals and the desires that we all have. We all have a purpose, I believe, on this earth to do something good. And it might be something big that a bunch of people are going to see. And it might be something really small that nobody ever sees besides, you know, maybe the, you know, the person that you're interacting with. But you have a, a purpose to fulfill here. And so I think it's important to know that you can choose yourself. You can choose to do the things that are going to put you in the best health. And so if you're not feeling healthy and you're not feeling like that good baseline when you wake up every day in general, like we all have our good days and bad days, right? It's not that you can never feel sad or never feel depressed about something, but it, like that, that experience is out there waiting for you. If you, if you're not having it right now and nutrition can change that just getting your nutrition, right. Can change everything. It can change your entire outlook. It can change your view of yourself, your, your true identity and your, your sense of self-worth and purpose in life. And that's what I want for every single human being. I want every single human being to feel like they matter and that they feel good and that they, they want to get up and do beautiful things every day. And so it's possible to feel good and it doesn't, you know, it's basically free. You just change what you buy at the grocery store, you know, and you get to stop supporting these companies that don't have your best interests in mind. They just want you to be addicted to their products so that they can continue to make a lot of money. They don't care about you. These drug companies don't care about you. They don't, they just want you to be a subscribed customer to their drugs for life. That's what they care about. And so you don't have to be dependent on that stuff anymore. You can be independent from that and then create the life that you want, that you deserve. That's, you know, I believe a birthright for all of us as human beings. And so just think critically, ask questions, open your mind up to new, to new ideas and new possibilities. You can try new things and Hey, if it doesn't work, you can always go back, you know? So don't be afraid to try something new because you never know how good you can really feel. Nia, where can people go find more of you and more of your beautiful work that you do? I know you have a YouTube channel called Nia's Way. Is there anywhere else you'd like to send people today? 
Um, yep. And YouTube is Nia's way. And I've kind of just started an Instagram under the same handle. So Nia's way. And right now I'm just posting my, my food daily and I track macros and, um, you know, all kinds of stuff under there. So if you're a, a kind of a weird data nerd, like I can be sometimes, um, you can follow me there as well. And I hope that that will give people some ideas of like, you know, what to eat and what I eat and my fasting routine and just kind of how I'm, you know, going about this lifestyle. And so, yeah, those are my two social medias um, that you can find me. I have a couple live streams every week on YouTube and, you know, uh, recorded videos as well. And anyone out there who either is or knows someone raising some little tiny humans, you need to follow this YouTube channel because that is the most important thing we can do, as we talked about, is to to start the next generation on the best possible foot we can so we can turn the ship around. Nia, thank you so, so much for joining me today. I had a wonderful time talking to you. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Appreciate it.